<laughs> if Christine Ford appears before the Senate tomorrow, as expected, she won't simply be speaking to members of the Judiciary Committee. She will also speak with Arizona sex crimes prosecutor Rachel Mitchell, who's been tapped to ask questions as an outside counsel. What sort of person is Rachel Mitchell? What does she do? And what sort of prosecutor has she been? Bill Montgomery will know the answer. He's a Maricopa County attorney, and he is Rachel Mitchell's boss. He joins us tonight. Thanks very much for coming on. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome, Tucker. So just to clarify something, the Washington Post, one of its columnists, uh, sent out a tweet today saying of Republicans in Congress, describing them as, quote, clueless old white guys, pick someone from Sheriff Joe Arpaio's operation. Is, is she from Sheriff Joe Arpaio's operation? Uh, no, Tucker, she's not. She's a deputy county attorney, which means she works for the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Sheriff's deputies and detention officers work for sheriffs. Thanks for clarifying that. What will she be doing tomorrow if Christine Ford attends this hearing? Well, if the hearing does go forward, my understanding is that she will assist the Judiciary Committee in trying to obtain information and get to the ground truth of whatever allegations have been made and cover the scope of those during the hearing. Exactly how she's going to do that, um, I've left her alone, as I do with my prosecutors when they're about ready to go into trial. Uh, and she'll be developing that line of questioning based upon her training, background, and experience, and whatever specific guidance she might get from the committee on areas of inquiry they really want her to cover. So what's her posture? What are her assumptions going into this? When she speaks to someone who has alleged a crime, a felony against somebody else, who says she's a victim, is the assumption from the prosecutor that she's telling the truth, that she's not, or is it neutral? Well, it, it's neutral. Um, you know, what Rachel will do is go in and start by listening and listen to what the allegations are, listen to what people are saying. Now, she certainly has a victim-centered focus as a prosecutor, but that doesn't mean you can't accept as ground truth everything that's said. It's really important for prosecutors and something she's been doing for about 25 years to listen to all the facts, assess what can be proven, what can be corroborated, what needs corroboration, and then conduct an overall review of the information that she's got in order to make a decision. Now, ordinarily for us as prosecutors, that decision is whether or not we should charge somebody with a crime, seek an indictment, and prosecute. That's not the scenario we have here. But that basic approach to getting information and trying to assess credibility and what type of corroboration there might be, that skill set is equally applicable. I've, I've noticed watching this story unfold that almost everybody on the periphery of it has been sucked in and damaged. It's Brett Kavanaugh's childhood friend Mark Judge, most people never heard of him, is now the center of a uh, you know, very intense criticism from the left just because he's been named. He hasn't said anything. Is, do you think she's ready for that? I mean, she could see her own character assassinated if she asks questions that Democrats don't like. Well, unfortunately, Tucker, that's not new for prosecutors. Uh, we get accused of things every single day. Uh, back here in her home jurisdiction, those who have litigated against Rachel, those who've worked with her, worked for her, or who've had the privilege of supervising her, know what her reputation is. And it's based upon her performance, her actions, and how she treats other people. Uh, and nothing that happens in the hearing tomorrow will be able to affect that. She'll be able to come back to her job. I hope she comes back to her job. She'll be able to come back to her job and pick up where she left off. And she's very well grounded, uh, professional, fair, and objective. And when she's done with this, she'll be able to leave it behind. That was a task that she was called upon to do. She'll perform it. And then it'll be done. And just like prosecutors have to move from one case to the next, and particularly in this area where you know, her background is in, uh, in right. sex crimes, you, you've got to be able to deal with the case, work with the victim, seek justice uh, from the accused, and then go to your next case. Yeah, seek so justice. That's the right. The, no one's seeking justice right now, so I'll be glad to see her uh, as the only person uh, doing that tomorrow. Thank you very much. You, you made us all feel better hearing that. Oh, you're very welcome, Tucker. Thank you. Thanks. So both Ford and Kavanaugh will be asked questions tomorrow in the Senate. What should those questions be? Joining us tonight is Francie Hakes. She's a former DOJ National Coordinator for Child Exploitation Prevention and Interdiction. Um, Francie, if you were crafting the questions to these two people whose stories do not match one another, what would those questions be? Well, Tucker, I mean, first, you have to challenge each account. 
You challenge Kavanaugh's denial, just like you challenge Dr. Ford's account. That's what a good prosecutor does. Your previous guest hit the nail right on the head. Prosecutors review cases and prepare for trial with an eye toward justice, not a conviction, but justice. And here, you've got an account that has some credibility issues. And so I expect this prosecutor, this seasoned prosecutor, to go over Dr. Ford's memory, to talk to her about other events that were happening in her life at the time, to test her memory, to ask her about the circumstances of her first disclosure to the therapist, the circumstances of the letter that she's written, and the in accuracies in some of her accounts, or at least they're internally inaccurate, right? At one point, she says it's her and four boys. At one point, she says two boys are in the room. At another, it's four boys and four, uh, two girls. Then it's four boys and one girl. All of these inconsistencies will be challenged by the prosecutor. Do you think, having worked on criminal cases at DOJ, that it's legitimate for lawmakers or, or justice officials to come at a case with assumptions based on immutable characteristics. In other words, there's a man, there's a woman, we know that women tell the truth more than men, men often lie, or vice versa. What happens to justice when you approach a case on those terms? Well, it, well, it's not justice, Tucker. And I've taken a lot of heat on social media for saying that this hashtag I believe her is absolutely moronic. That is not justice. 200 years of jurisprudence argue against believing a bare accusation. And people say, oh, it's not a criminal trial. It's a job interview. I don't care what it is. You're calling someone a sex offender and a rapist. He has absolutely every right to have those allegations challenged tested, and even questioned, and that's not victim-blaming. It's simply seeking justice. What you said used to be obvious. I, I don't think I ever met anyone who would disagree with that. Now it seems half the country thinks what you're saying is a microaggression, if not a macroaggression. Where does that leave us? Can you get justice in a place where people assume that your immutable characteristics determine your behavior? No, you, Tucker, this is so appalling to me. You might as well fire every prosecutor, every police officer, and every defense attorney in this country if we're going to proceed on the assumption that people are guilty merely because of a bare allegation. Just go ahead and take, keep everyone in prison who's there and let everyone just start writing in letter accusations and make an allegation and someone goes to prison. That is not this country. It's yeah. not the country I grew up in. It's not the country I was a prosecutor in for many years, and it's not the country I want to be in. No, it's not the one I want to live in either, or I don't think any of us do. Francie, thank you very much for that perspective. Thank you. Despite what you just heard, many in Washington are calling the presumption of innocence an impediment to justice rather than a critical part of it. We'll ask one Democrat if that's really the world we want to live in. Plus, Alan Dershowitz joins us to weigh in on the Kavanaugh story in some detail. Stay with us.